Good morning. Thank you for joining us. And I know we're, we're, we've got several that are going to be on this call, and I appreciate you being here. My name is Terry Kimball, and I'm the president and CEO here at the Chandler Chamber. And we are really pleased to bring you these continued success seminars for our businesses here, as well as we've got a great program plan for you. And one of our sponsors, we do this in conjunction with the City of Chandler's um, Industrial Development Authority. So we want to thank them for their um, um, continued contributions for these types of programs. So today I have with me um, Richard Dretzler with Fenimore, Craig, Dowling, and Aaron. And Richard is actually a um, an expert in recreational marijuana. Now that it's legalized, now what? But let me give you a little bit of background about Richard. Richard works actually out of Fenimore Craig's um, Las Vegas office in the business litigation practice group, where he actually focuses primarily in the areas of labor and uh, employment law, um, administrative law, and general commercial litigation, including construction, and has more than two decades of experience as a business litigator. So formerly a deputy attorney general in Nevada, he also maintains administrative law practice and prosecuted regulatory infractions by professional licensees and served on as a board counsel during hearings and appellate court proceedings for the Nevada District Courts and also the Nevada Supreme Court. Beginning in 1996 with a clerkship in Las Vegas, today Richard is a fixture in the Nevada legal community, and he thoroughly enjoys the mental challenges of working at, large, at a large law firm on complex litigation matters and a dynamic team of business litigation attorneys. He views his work here um, looking at a puzzle, seeking new approaches to solving problems, which may be unseen at first, at first glance. He was elected to the State Bar of Nevada Board of Directors in 2013 and is a proud liaison to the State Board of Continuing Education. He also serves as a national chairperson for the Nevada Public Radio NP, um, KNPR. So Richard, I just wanna thank you for joining us. And I know that Andrea on your team is on our Board of Directors. And what I think that you really bring is also a um, nationwide, you've got that expertise, not only in Nevada, but um, it really, um, and all of our employees are really, this is new to us here. Um, so I'm really anxious to see your presentation today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Although anytime anyone characterizes me as an expert on re recreational marijuana, I, I, have to wa I have to watch how that plays because <laughs> it could mean different things. I meant it, that means in the employment context. Um, that's right. So, that's right. <laughs> but no, thank you so much for having me here. Um, we're, I'm just delighted to be here. Um, this is a topic that is very timely, and I, I provide advice and counseling to employers all the time. And this is probably one of the top one or two topics that we've had, even through COVID, is how to deal with uh, the marijuana issues because it's it's gone in stages from the you know uh, medicinal to recreational, and now it, it's a whole different ballgame. So. Um, I do have a presentation, so let me see if I can share my screen and we can get started. And while you're doing that, I just want to let all of our attendees know that if you want to put your questions in the chat after Richard's done with his presentation, we'll open it up for some questions to answer them. So please okay. feel free to do that. And Richard, Great. I'm going to turn off my so that we can have the focus on you and your presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, well, um, the the today, let me share my screen here. Um, whoa. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, got it. And now slideshow. Perfect. Okay, great. So uh, we're, we're talking about recreational marijuana's impact on the workplace. Um, obviously, a, a timely subject for, for so many people. And this is an Arizona-centric presentation. So uh, everything that I'm going to talk about will be with regard to Arizona law. I'm, I am licensed in Arizona as well as Nevada, so I can uh, speak on legal issues in this state. So that's me. Um, just a few housekeeping issues. I would ask everyone, please mute your microphone. Um, and then, you know, the standard disclaimer that a webinar does not constitute legal advice. I'm certainly happy to uh, answer any questions that
that you might have, but in terms of formal legal advice that, that we would have to handle that in, in sort of a more formal setting. So I'm sure everyone understands that. And as Terry mentioned, uh, please use the chat function for any questions that you might have. Um, and uh, lastly, questions are limited to the webinar. If there are questions that sort of are adjacent to the topics I'm gonna talk about, then you can certainly uh, reach out and we can talk, talk about those with you uh, differently, okay? So let's go, here we go, recreational marijuana. Okay, so in, the, in uh, Arizona, um, there was a Proposition 207 that was uh, part of the last election cycle. Uh, the law would allow limited marijuana possession use and cultivation by adults that are 21 years or older. It would amend criminal penalties for marijuana possession and ban smoking marijuana in public and impose a 16% excise tax on marijuana sales to fund public programs, authorize state and local regulation of marijuana licensees, and allow expungement of marijuana offenses. So for folks who have already been convicted of marijuana offenses that are nonviolent, they will be expunged or, or removed from people's record. And Arizona passed that measure, 59% uh, percent to 40%, as you can see. I think the revenue potential of this was just too much for, too attractive for the Arizona legislature to ignore. Um, it's anticipated to generate $300 million in revenue to be divided between community colleges, municipal police, sheriff and fire departments, fire districts, highway funds, public health programs and infrastructure for the state and other plans um, for improvement of state projects in various ways. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the 10,000 foot view of this. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about Prop 207 uh, and the Smart and Safe Arizona Act because this, this comes down to a balancing of rights while, while the state is now conferring on people the right to possess and use marijuana, there are also some, um, some, uh, some uh, guardrails in place to make sure that that right is not abused and it doesn't impinge on a, a, a business owner's right to manage their business as they see fit. But in terms of detail, um, the, the Prop 207 allows adults who are 21 years or older to use, possess, or transfer up to one ounce of personal use it allows adults to cultivate for personal use not more than six marijuana plants or 12 if you have two or more adults residing in the same home provided the plants are secure. So you can all get into the uh, homegrown marijuana business, um, which is interesting. Um, it bans smoking marijuana in public places and open spaces. And as I mentioned earlier, it amends criminal classifications and penalties for marijuana possession and use. It also allows courts to vacate and expunge certain marijuana charges and convictions, as I said. And then there's a 16% excise tax on marijuana sales to fund community college infrastructure, et cetera. So that's, those are the broad strokes of the proposition itself. Okay, so what does this mean for employers? Um, the proposed Arizona statute 36-2851 sub one says that the law does not quote, affect the ability of employers to have workplace policies restricting the use of marijuana by employees or prospective employees. Um, sub two states that the law does not require an employer to allow or accommodate the use, consumption, possession, transfer, display, transportation, sale, or cultivation of marijuana in a place of employment. And so, as I said earlier, you as business owners and managers have the ability to make sure that your business is marijuana free, regardless of what folks are doing uh, in their personal time. And subsection two would not be necessary if subsection one was limited to the workplace. So you can see how one and two fit together because you can't have the ability to, um, to control your workplace if you can't forbid something from happening in your workplace. Okay, so the Smart and Safe Arizona Act appears to allow employers to implement and maintain policies prohibiting employees from using recreational marijuana off duty and outside the workplace. Um, so interestingly, you, you know, I know there's a, a subset of folks who might be listening that are, have federal contracts or are federal contractors themselves. Or, or subcontractors, et cetera. If you are a federal contractor, you are subject to the Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988. So interestingly, in that situation, the change in Arizona law would have no bearing on your obligation to keep your workplace marijuana free because federal law takes precedence over state law. Now, the trend is that that's, that's probably going to change, I suspect, in the next few years. But uh, right now, you've got the, the federal law, which is... Um, uh, you know, very strict on this point, and states have taken it into their into, into their own um, purview to to loosen the restrictions on marijuana. So, you'll see that conflict get resolved, I suspect, in the years to come. Okay, um, so let's talk about medical marijuana for a moment. 
Um, the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act, uh, AMMA, prohibits employers from discriminating against applicants uh, or taking adverse action against employees based on either the person's status as a cardholder or a cardholder's positive test for marijuana components or metabolites unless the cardholder used, possessed, or was impaired by marijuana on the employer's premises during work hours. And so um, this has this smacks of uh, Americans with Disabilities Act type issues where if someone has a, a legitimate medical purpose for um, for using marijuana to alleviate a, a, a medical problem, then you know to to cause adverse things to happen to them in their employment because of that is arguably um, discriminatory on the basis of disability. And so, um, as it says, as a person, you, you have to you cannot take action against someone because they're a cardholder or because um, they test positively. Um, but again, there's that caveat language in there that says that if they are if they use, possessed, or were impaired on on the premises. If, if they are you know, impaired at work and you can tell that, then certainly you can um, you know, take adverse action against them, which, which makes sense. Now under the AMMA, the question, really the question is, can you fire someone simply for having a medical marijuana card? Obviously the statute says no. Um, there's no discrimination against car, those with, mar with, with cards is allowed unless not doing so would cause you to lose a federal contract. And this language solves the problem of federal law and state law coming into, into conflict. So how far does this federal loop, loophole go? In other words, if you run a nursing home, for example, and you take federal Medicare dollars, um, how far does that go? And that's, it's arguable, but it has not been decided by the courts yet. And so we're gonna talk a little bit later about something called safety sensitive positions. That's when these come into play, which is another exemption to this requirement that's been, been created. And we'll talk about that later. And all this comes down to is if you're going to make, if you're going to take an action against somebody and marijuana is involved, um, there's a normal set of rules. But if you have, if the nature of the position that person occupies is safety sensitive, they drive a truck, they operate heavy machinery, they uh, are customer facing, they deal with patients uh, or what have you. I mean, there's a million different safety sensitive type positions, then the balance of rights gets tilted a little more in the in favor of employers because you know there's a legitimate reason that a business has to regulate things more closely. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Um, this is a case that, uh, that came out uh, two years ago or a little under two years ago, the Whitmire versus Walmart stores, which is really interesting. So we'll talk about that. Uh, Whitmire was a customer service supervisor who was injured at work, and two days later, she went to urgent care for her injuries. Uh, per Walmart's policy for workplace injuries, she took a drug test, and she then informed Walmart that she had a medical marijuana card. She had a med medical marijuana card for approximately five years, and she smoked it before going to bed to treat shoulder pain and arthritis and as a sleep aid. So when she came in because of the injury, her urine tested positive for marijuana metabolites. Now, um, she continued to work for six weeks until she was suspended as a result of the urine sample, and then she was fired because of the positive drug test. So she brought a lawsuit in June of 2017, alleging wrongful termination and discrimination in violation of AMMA, the Arizona Civil Rights Act, and Arizona Workers' Comp Laws. Okay, so... Um, Let's keep going. We'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more. So under the, the applicable statute in this decision was AMMA, which says a registered qualifying patient shall not be considered to be under the influence of marijuana solely because of the presence of metabolites or components of marijuana that appear in insufficient concentration to cause impairment. So what this means is if, if you have, if you test, if it's tested, uh, if you are tested in the course of employment and it shows up in your bloodstream, but you are not impaired, you simply have the presence of it, then that by itself is not, uh, is not technically considered to meet the definition of under the influence. Under the influence is that your, your behavior is affected in some tangible way, not that it merely shows up in your bloodstream. Okay. So what, where, did, well, where did the uh, case, the court come down in, uh, in the Whitmire case? The, the case did not address the issue of safety sensitive positions. So we'll, we'll, we'll still, we're still gonna talk about those a little bit more. But it, the, the court held that employees have an implied co private right, co private cause of action under AMMA. 
Um, this is adverse to another decision, which was uh, the UPS decision in, in to also 2019, where Superior Court held that no private cause of action exists under AMMA, but the employee could bring a wrongful term claim under the AEPA, Arizona Employment Protection Act, and use AMMA as public policy. What, what they're saying is um, that there's, there's another legal theory to allow a person to sue, um, which is distinguished from this case. Um, so the, the Drug Testing of Employees Act under Arizona law, um, the, the good faith defense is still valid. Um, and what that means is that if you are, if you choose to drug test and you have a plausible reason that you can articulate for testing someone, in other words, they're in a position, you know, like I mentioned before, a safety sensitive position, et cetera, um, then you can, uh, then that defense is still valid under Whitmire. Although it, I, I want to be clear, it doesn't mention safety sensitive positions, but the, the, the basic concept is still there. Um, but you, the other part of the holding is that you cannot, um, make it make an employment decision based solely on a positive drug test if the employee has a medical marijuana card as we talked about earlier you have you need actual evidence that the employee was impaired while working what, what are we looking at in terms of that sort of evidence um, a manager or supervisor witness statements providing that the employee was exhibiting symptoms of impairment slurring walking unsteadily smelled like pot etc um, expert testimony regarding the results of the drug test that uh, sufficient marijuana levels to suggest impairment. So as I said before, um, if, if it simply is a trace amount in your bloodstream, that is not enough to justify it, to justify considering someone impaired uh, while at work. But if, the, if, if an expert can testify that while it was a small amount, it was enough to produce impairment, then that would be sufficient to show that the, um, the person was impaired while at work. Okay, so let me go back just a little bit, a little bit more about Whitmire. As I said, the court did not address the issue of safety sensitive positions. And um, while there is some clarity on the point, it's not crystal clear yet. So in terms of takeaway advice and, and you know, general points to consider, I think employees should try to characterize the positions that they're filling as safety sensitive. In other words, don't hang that label on it. But if the nature of a position lends itself to that, then, then try to think about that in those terms, because that, that gets you a different set of protections as an employer if you make a decision about someone's employment based upon their involvement with marijuana. Um, so as I said, Whitmire doesn't touch on that. Um, okay, so let's, let's see, if we, see if we have any questions here. No questions so far, so let's go back to it. Richard, we'll go ahead and take questions at the end. Oh, sure. No problem okay. at all. Perfect. You, uh, sounds good. Thanks. Okay. So, okay. So, and there, you know, as I mentioned, the Whitmire decision didn't really touch on the issue of safety sensitive positions in the workplace, but Lee versus Albertson certainly did. Um, in Lee versus Albertson's, which is a, um, a, a district a court case from Arizona, that federal court, presented the issue, constitutional issue of whether the Arizona legislature's 2011 amendment to DTEA, which allows employers to exclude individuals from safety sensitive positions based upon a good faith belief of current drug use is un, an unconstitutional amendment of AMMA. And so what they're, what they're saying is it's always a balancing of rights. So, you know, because state law now gives people a right to engage in medical marijuana, because that's what AMMA deals with, then, um, if you are an employer and you want to exclude someone from a safety sensitive position on that basis, what this case is saying is, what this case dealt with is the issue of whether you are simply, whether you can have a good faith belief in current drug use or whether you need actual evidence of impairment to, uh, to justify that, um, that, that change. So, um, okay, DTA safety sensitive positions are being challenged. Um, of course, that's, so as I said, the safety sensitive position concept is, is one of um, a lot of um, uh, controversy at the moment. Um, the Voter Protection Act of VPA amended Arizona's constitution in 1998 to limit the legislature's authority to amend measures approved by voter initiatives. Under the Voter Protection Act, the legislature cannot amend an initiative unless it obtains a supermajority with three quarters of each house and the amendment furthers the purpose of the initiative, the AMMA was enacted by voter initiative. And so um, it, what this is saying is if, we're, if there's going to be an attempt to overcome what the voters have approved with AMMA, 
um, it's going to take a very high uh, hurdle to to be overcome. Um, but nevertheless, there is there is a mechanism in the law for that to happen under the BPA. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about safety sensitive positions. Um, the argument with safety sensitive positions is that the designation permitted by DTEA is unconstitutional. And this is this is what I talked about in Lee versus Albertsons before. It's another constitutional amendment to AMMA because it allows employees to be excluded from a safety position if they have a medical marijuana card. AMMA says that you cannot be discriminated against as an employee unless, uh, for being a cardholder, unless the failure to do so would cause the employer to lose benefits, which is a narrow exception, or when the employee uses, possesses, or is impaired by mar marijuana at work. So you can see how, how that, that comes into play. Um, Let's see a little bit more about safety sensitive positions. The argument is that the DTA effectively is a third circumstance in which it is permissible to discriminate against an employee based on a cardholder status when the employee is in a safety sensitive position. The question of whether the amendment is legal is whether it furthers the purpose of AMMA. The court held in Lee that the, uh, the safety sensitive amendment did not further the purpose of AMMA. And that's a tentative ruling, which means it's still subject to discussion and appeal. But the court found that the purpose of the AMMA was that those using medical marijuana would not be penalized for such use. So where the case stands currently is, and I know I'm, I know I've talked about a lot of you know legalese on this, but basically the court is saying that um, AMMA is is was enacted to provide those that were using medical marijuana with a no, no penalty for use, and <clears throat> and by allowing employers to sort of pivot into hanging the label of safety sensitive position on something that um, without full justification for it, that in essence allows, it's an exception that swallows the rule. It allows an employer to decide, oh, I'm gonna to refer to this as a, uh, a safety sensitive position and, um, and thereby you know, circumvent the whole AMMA. And so, um, and that, that's, the, the, the law on this is in flux. So that's what, you know, I know I said before that you should try to do that, but the, the law is in flux. And I think if you have, if you have a job which is by definition something where safety sensitivity cannot be disputed, like healthcare, um, uh, you know, drivers, operators of heavy machinery, where there's no there's no arguable dispute that the person you're hiring has to have no impairment because people could get hurt or killed, then um, I think that's going to be a safe haven for you as an employer. Whereas if you if it's more of an office scenario, it's going to be a little harder. Um, Unless you can, um, unless there are facts that are unusual that make it more justifiable. So, okay. So, so what can employers do? I know I've thrown a lot of information at you. Um, what can employers do? I mean, the the Lee case that I mentioned is not set, the case is settled. In other words, it's been resolved in terms of the the litigants. But the issue is going to occur again until we get a final a final decision from the courts. Um, you need to understand that the continuing to rely on the safety sensitive position exception has some risk. And we talked about what that is um, because unless you have a, a, a ready justification for uh, putting a, make calling a position safety sensitive, you're in effect um, undercutting what, what courts believe to be the essence of AMMA, which is that you can have a consequence free access to marijuana if you have a card and if you comply with the rules of that, of that statute. Um, but it's important for employers to show to demonstrate impairment. As I've said, a positive urine test alone will not be enough. So what would be enough? Expert testimony, testing, perhaps a second test with, with blood work, um, management super, supervisor or witness documentation. Um, and, and also you shouldn't test for marijuana unless you have a reasonable suspicion of impairment that you can document. And you know, simply having somebody come to you and say, wow, that guy looks stoned because his eyes are bloodshot. Um, that's not going to do it. If, if, you, if you are in a situation where you observe someone and you believe that they are impaired, I would, I would note prodigiously um, why you believe that and what facts you have to support that and make sure that that is available. Because as, as with so many other things in, in employment law, if, it's not, if it wasn't written down, it didn't happen in many circumstances. So make sure that you have all of the steps that you took and all of the, the, the observations that were made by you or whomever uh, in writing and in verifiable form. Okay. And uh, the other recommendation is test, but treat those with medical marijuana, with a medical marijuana card as if they had been a prescription for other drugs. Remember that re recreational marijuana is likely not protected. 
And so just to be clear, what I've talked about with regard to marijuana largely was AMMA. The recreational stuff is dealt with is dealt with differently. It's 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 much more simple in the sense that the the, the law gives employees a right to use marijuana uh, in their off hours so long as it doesn't impact their job and so long as they are not impaired while at work. Um, it's only in the medical marijuana context that things are a little a little murkier because you have a, a legitimate medical reason to be impaired under certain circumstances. Um, I, I guess I would think about the recreational marijuana similar to like alcohol. Um, alcohol is certainly legal. It's certainly something people can consume in their off hours. Um, but if, if consumption of alcohol either occurs at work or occurs prior to work, but impacts your ability to work, then that's something which provides you with uh, a basis to discipline or otherwise um, uh, modify a, a person's employment. Uh, and I would treat recreational marijuana similarly. Okay, so let's see. Oh, let me back up for a moment. Okay, so in, in the states where recreational marijuana has been legalized, the, the question becomes, how do you square that with the ability of an employer to conduct pre-employment testing? In other words, if someone has the right to consume marijuana, um, and I have a right under the law to conduct pre-employment testing, how do those things fit together? Well, for employers that are not governed by federal regulations, because as I mentioned earlier, under federal law, it's a pretty easy, it's a bright line standard. You know, you just, it has to be stamped out wherever you come across it. Or you don't have segments of safety sensitive employees. In other words, if you're in an office setting, oops, sorry, there has been uh, a movement away from pre-employment testing. Um, med as I mentioned, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana are treated differently under the law. So if it's medical, you could be dealing with Americans with Disability Act issues, ADA. And if the person has a legitimate health issue that they treat with marijuana, you could use that and, and you use that as a complete bar to hiring them, you could get in some trouble. Recreational is different. However, what I've said is in the context of pre-employment testing. Um, that's a different animal from post-employment testing. Once someone has been hired, then random screenings where the employee is in a position that they're required to be sober and precise are absolutely in order. You have a, you have a much greater set of rights to test uh, once the hire has occurred because you're dealing with things that have come up in the workplace, like an event happens, an accident, for example, a truck, you know, so in, in, a, in a delivery situation where someone crashes a company truck, that is a, a perfectly acceptable circumstance to say, I want this person tested because um, I have reason to think there may that may be an impairment issue. Um, and, and also, you know, employers have an inherent obligation to uh, prevent uh, risks to the health and safety of others in the workplace. And clamping down on consumption or impairment under of marijuana by marijuana while in the workplace, you can see how that would impact your ability as an employer to protect, others in the workplace. In other words, if you're working in a warehouse, for example, with, the, with you know, baler equipment or some very dangerous equipment, um, if someone's impaired, not only does it put them at risk, not only does it put you as a company at risk in terms of liability, but it also presents a, a health and safety threat to everyone else who works there because, you know, God knows what could happen. So, um, so, so obviously, um, if you do have evidence that an employee has sold, solicited, or used drugs in the workplace, um, or there is unusual conduct, there's um, a workplace accident or incident, those are all circumstances where you are on very solid ground to say, I want to uh, do, some, uh, do some drug testing because I have a feeling something, I have a sense that something might have been drug related on this or, or marijuana influenced on this. So, um, so just to kind of sum this up, you have, to, you have to think of it in terms of, first you have to evaluate the type of position that you have and determine whether it's safety sensitive or not. And then if you can characterize it as, don't use the label safety sensitive because I think that's what's, uh, what's under litigation right now. But if you can characterize something as safety sensitive, that's just another way of saying that you have a justification as an employer for making different decisions about a person's employment. Uh, where marijuana is involved. Um, then, you know, once you've determined the type of position that you have and how you, you know, how that fits into the safety continuum, whether it's highly, a highly sensitive or, or not as much, 
then you have to consider where are you? Is it, are we, you know, are, are we dealing with a, a medical situation? Does the person have a card or don't they? Um, or is it simply recreational? And then um, are we dealing with uh, pre-employment or post-employment? Um, if, if, if it's a hiring situation, that's one set of things to consider. But if it's post-hiring, then it should be keyed to um, a, a, an event that has occurred, like a, um, uh, you know, a, an accident, as I've described, or, or something which would lead you to, to want to test people for, uh, for marijuana. And then your rights as an employer are, are, are enhanced at that point. Okay, so um, just in terms of do's and don'ts, um, I wanted to summarize just a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, if, if you're business owners, you, you're doing this anyway, or business, you know, if you're managers in business, you're doing this anyway, but it, you know, I'm sure your lawyers are always telling you this. I, I, I think it couldn't hurt to hear it again. Always can create contemporaneous documents of what's going on, document what is happening, when it's happening, why it's happening. It's, you know, who, what, where, when, and why. Make sure you get that down. Even if it's just opening up a Word document and just typing some things into it, just so you have it. Never backdate documents. Um, always include the date of the incident and the report and include the full names of at least, at least once, um, then initials or a first name is okay. Um, Another thing to another th uh, thing that may come up or another wrinkle to this is what if you get an anonymous report from an employee saying, I have reason to think that this person over here is impaired. Um, that's tricky because if the person's not willing to go on the record, I mean, you know, as an employer, if you get an anonymous complaint, you, you, you would probably check it out to see if there's some merit to it. But if, you, if there's nothing that you can verify as the employer, then um, you know an anonymous an anonymous statement is not as so shall we say compelling or or you know worth you know going to bat on as compared with um, a statement that somebody's willing to to put their name to, um, but of course confidentiality uh, of the investigation um, attaches as as is usually the case in any HR investigation. Okay, so um, just some other do's and don'ts with regard to handling these issues. Avoid expressing personal opinions, accusations, or judging. I know that, uh, as I was mentioning to to the folks uh, this morning, you know, depending on your age and and your the culture you grew up in, you know, marijuana. When I when I was coming up, I can speak for myself. When I was coming up, marijuana was just completely forbidden across the board. It was not something that had to be dealt with. It was not something that you even had to think about. If an employer had reason to think that you uh, were consuming marijuana and that showed up in, in a blood test or, you know, et, et cetera, a pre-employment test, et cetera, then that was it. They were within their rights to let you go. And so it, it's like the federal standard that I mentioned earlier was everywhere. Uh, but that's changed. And so we have to sort of not express personal opinions about it, make accusations or judging. Um, I would also avoid generalities, overstatements, and exaggerations. Um, you know, if, if someone is displaying some characteristics that give you concern, I would really describe what those characteristics are in detail rather than saying, wow, he was stoned or, you know, boy, that person was, was, was really stoned, etc. cetera. Um, describe what it is you are identifying. Um, they are stumbling. Um, they appear disoriented. Their eyes appear red, red and bloodshot or whatever the characteristics are. Just so... Um, You've, you, you've got specifics in there which have more weight to them because um, I, I, you know, generalities are, are not as helpful as you might think. And you know, as you would with any HR investigation, you wanna make sure that you reach conclusions um, in light of all the facts. Um, so so you, know, you wanna look at legal conclusions and medical conclusions. If it's, a, if it's a medical marijuana situation involving a card or something like that, make sure that the illness that the person is claiming that they uh, consume marijuana to address is a legitimate medical issue. And you have the right to do that as you would with any ADA uh, situation. Um, and in terms of the legal conclusions, you know, make sure that you're on solid ground. You can, uh, a great way to do this is to consult with an attorney as you go so that, you know, you can say, hey, um, I've got somebody that I'm contemplating letting go. These are the circumstances of the investigation. And uh, it, it 
could, could never hurt to run this past your attorney and have them sort of bless what you're doing. Um, you know, there's a whole segment of employment law called employment counseling, which is before anything even goes to court, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lawyers that are talented in hearing your facts and giving you advice based on the situation. So I would definitely run something like this past them um, so you can confirm the legal conclusions that you have come to. Um, and make sure you've got all the facts. I mean, if you if there's multiple witnesses, make sure that you've spoken to them all and make sure you get written statements from them all. Um, and try to go into it as you would with any HR investigation um, with no preconceived notions. So, um, you know, if everyone has a conception that someone is obviously impaired or smokes a lot of pot in their off hours or whatever, for whatever reason, um, you, you have to set that aside and go where the facts lead you. Don't come to a predetermined outcome because very often what you see, and you know, we see this in cases where judges decide things this way and also in, in internal investigations, you come to the conclusion about where you want to go and then you set up the facts behind it to justify the outcome you wanted to reach. And that is a, a recipe for disaster. That is something you never want to do. And if, if after you put the facts together and the statements together, you are convinced in your gut that the person is probably stoned, but the fact or, or was stoned on duty, but the facts aren't there to suggest it, then um, the facts are what the facts are. If you don't have the facts, and it's, it's a recreational situation, not a medical marijuana situation, you uh, you know don't be swayed. Don't let a predisposition against marijuana, which many people have. Um, sway the decision that you reach when you investigate uh, a case involving an employee. Okay, so here's an example of um, something that I, I uh, uh, a, a nice example of, of kind of how to deal with these things. Um, so, so you get a complaint from someone named Susie who says earlier this month, Betty was completely wasted and I suspect she was high on marijuana or drunk and is in need of immediate rehabilitation. Now, there's many problems with, so if you get that on a piece of paper, there is many problems with that, that, that statement from an evidentiary standpoint. It's not contemporaneous. In other words, it, it doesn't say this date at this time, I observed that Betty was completely wasted. It just makes a generality. And I said before, we want to avoid generalities. Um, this person never spoke to Betty, or at least we don't know whether this person spoke to Betty. Because this person is just this person has come to a conclusion that Betty was completely wasted, and you know it doesn't contain something like um, I, I I asked Betty about this and she denied it or something like that. You also want to, you always want to get the side of the person who is the subject of the complaint. Obviously, that's that's you know basic stuff. Um, it doesn't have a date on it. It doesn't have Betty's last name, and it reaches improper conclusions um, because. Um, you know, just because let's say let's say Susie's right, and let's say Betty was completely wasted at work or uh, or high or drunk. There's certainly no. I mean, that certainly can happen, and that is certainly something which is um, a major violation of any any company's HR policies to be that intoxicated at work, whether from marijuana or alcohol. But it reaches an improper conclusion because of that last sentence, that last portion of the sentence, and is in need of immediate rehabilitation. How does how does Susie know that? You know, how does Susie know that someone needs rehabilitation? There, I can conceive of a million situations where someone um, you know drank too many glasses of wine at lunch and came back, and they may be completely wasted. But that doesn't mean they need to go to rehab. So that's a judgment on Susie's part that you need to factor out of the of the analysis. Um, and that's an example of an improper conclusion that we want to avoid. Okay. Um, you know, I, and also improper conclusions may have regarded Betty as having a disability. And that's, you know, so when you say in need of immediate rehabilitation, that smacks of ADA concerns. Because if someone is in need of rehabilitation, it's reasonable to assume they have alcoholism. And then uh, that's a disrecognized disability. And so that kicks in a whole different set of rights that we have to consider. So, um, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take an employee's conclusions on face value unless you've done your own investigation and have facts to, to support that. And there's no description of the conduct in question, like I said before. There's no, um, you know, characterization of what she was doing. She was stumbling, she, her eyes were blurry, she slurred her speech, um, she fell asleep, what have you. 
no description of the conduct. And so that's, that's obviously a problem with the statement. Okay, so the other way to look at this is, is this reliable evidence? Is this something that you want to expose your company to legal action on the basis of this information? And I think the answer is li likely not. Um, there's some other things in here that I, you know, that, that concern me. Um, the, the phrase, I suspect. Um, <laughs> anytime people suspect things, that means they have a possibility of being wrong. So, you know, it, 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 in your businesses, I'm sure you, you deal with that all the time, but there's a, there's a big difference between someone suspecting something is true and someone knowing something is true. Um, you know, and, and is the logic sound? Uh, do, can we say that this person is in need of rehab? Um, for the, do they have the disability of alcoholism? That's a, that's a logical leap from Susie and we don't know if that's true or not. So we wanna take that into consideration as well. Now, what's a, what's a, a different way to attack the problem which um, might be a little more acceptable? Um, after the company supervisors were coached, the Susie, Susie wrote the following. On July 12, 2013 at approximately 1.15 PM, I observed Betty Smith walking in an unsteady manner to her office. When I walked into Betty's office, I could see that she stumbled to get to her chair. So let's digest that little piece. You've got a date, you've got a time, you've got specific observations about what it is that Betty was doing. Um, when I asked Betty if she was okay, she stared at me and slowly slurred, hmm, that's a great question. So also we, we have a, an, an additional improvement over the last statement because Betty was actually asked, are you okay? Or her, her input was included in the statement. And then the person says, I could smell what appeared to be marijuana on her clothes, and I could see her eyes were bloodshot and watery. Um, I, you know, when I see the phrase appeared to be, you know, I, that's, uh, you know, you, you're assuming that the person who is the, the complaining party uh, is, is a good judge of these things. But I mean, I guess we all have an understanding of what, are, what you know, appears to be marijuana on somebody's clothes, but it, it could be something else. But I still like that a whole lot better than you know saying she's stoned or like or some the generalities of the prior statement. And it says I could see her eyes were bloodshot and watery, so that's specifics. We like those. I immediately told Betty that based on my observations, I suspect that she may be under the influence of alcohol or drugs, which is great because we have an additional instance where the complaining employee spoke with the, the employee that's the subject of the complaint and said, "This is what I'm seeing." And I think that you may be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. I proceeded to instruct her to gather her belongings and pursuant to our policy, she would be required to get a test to determine if she was under the influence in violation of our policy, which is great because you're, you're using the workplace policy the way it should be. You're reminding me of the potentially offending employee of what has happened and telling them of the consequences of what has to happen. They need to have a test to determine if they were under the influence in violation of policy. Um, and you know, so th this is all very good as opposed to more of a 10,000 foot view that we got from the prior statement. Um, a lot of this is common sense stuff in terms of management, but, uh, but in the context of marijuana, it's tricky because um, you can have it in your blood and still not be under the influence. And what, what the, the, as I understand it, marijuana, just like alcohol affects people differently. So someone could have you know, three martinis and be perfectly fine. Uh, in terms of how they appear to you, or someone could have one joint and be, you know, completely, um, uh, completely impaired. So there's really, uh, but nevertheless, if that occurs at work, it's it's a problem. But what I'm trying to say is that because of the of the nature of the substance, it affects different people differently. So you have to account for that in how you investigate and document complaints of that nature. Okay. So that's that's what I had. Uh, it's about a quarter of. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to to answer them at this time. I've got a couple questions. Thank you so much, Richard. You had, um, I'm jotting down all kinds of notes because um, you always learn things on these types of, of webinars. So a couple of things, can you reiterate or talk again, um, companies are getting away from pre-employment testing? Well, um, pre-employment testing is, is, is more fraught than it used to be. It's, it's got more problems attached to it because of the marijuana issue. Um, I, I guess I would say I, the pre-employment testing is trickier because um, not every state has this, the statute that Arizona has, which says that you can't hold that against somebody in terms of employment decisions, unless there's a, a, reason, a basis connected to their performance. 
But the pre-employment screening is riskier generally because um, of, of those issues. If, if, it's a sub, if it's a substance that you have the right to consume in your off hours, then the presence of it in your blood as a pre-employment pre -employment drug test um, is, it, 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 it puts you into a legal situation where you have to justify the reasons that you are, are, are saying you still don't want to hire that person and that creates issues for you. Okay. How, how would these recreational marijuana, um, how does that, how are you um, suggesting employers handle the remote worker? Ah, okay. Well, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I mean, that, we're all dealing with that right now in various ways. I mean, heck, I'm working remotely myself right now. Um, I, I'm assuming that when people work remotely, there are benchmarks for their performance. They have to log in. They, their, their conduct is of record. In other words, the, the employer can document they logged in at a certain time, they logged out at a certain time, and their productivity is at a certain, a certain level. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's really difficult to say, I mean, I mean if I, like I said, if the, as I mentioned before, if someone is impaired and they handle it well, as is often the case, someone can, can drink a lot or consume a lot of marijuana and still be, still have it together. If they're working remotely, you might not be able to tell. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a really difficult situation. Um, that's why I'm not a fan of working remotely, but I, I'm in the minority on that right now. Uh, so I, I guess the answer to your question is we're going to have to kind of deal with it as it, as it goes. Um, but it, the telltale signs will generally be there if deadlines are not being met, if professionalism is not being maintained, if, um, if people are late, if people leave early, if people interact with others and they are re reported to be under the influence. Those are all things that despite working remotely, you can still identify. It's just harder when you don't have everyone in the same place. So another one in relation to that, um, many companies hire like independent contractors to do, you know, service or that kind of thing, or just because they can't handle the sheer volume. How does this new law affect the independent contractors that you may hire or what triggers or what mechanisms should an employer put in place to protect them? Well, um, th this, believe it or not, from my perspective, this kind of delves into the realms of insurance, because if you're, let's say you're a, con I deal with a lot of construction litigation as an example. So if you're a construction company and you're a general contractor and you have subcontractors that work for you, there's going to be contracts where the subcontractor is obligated to have you as the general contractor as a named insured in their insurance policy. And so if, if there's, from, from a liability standpoint, if someone who is a subcontractor of yours, independent contractor, goes off and while their employee is impaired, kills somebody, God forbid, then that, you know, that, that's something that you as a general contractor, as the, the contracting party, need to protect yourself from and insurance setup will, will, will prevent that from happening. Um, you know, it, it becomes a lot easier from if you are the contracting employee, if you like, for example, if you're a temp agency, or let's say you, you, you hire temps to work for you, and one of those temps comes to you and is impaired, that is not your issue to deal with necessarily. I mean, you have to maintain the safety and security of your workplace, but that's an issue to drop on the desk of the company that is the employer of that person. Um, so in a way, it's almost easier because if that person is borrowed, or you know, a, um, an independent contractor of some kind, you can go directly to the um, the, the person that that sent you that borrowed employee and say this person is you know is out of it. There's some there's something going on here, and then it's up to them to do the investigation, not you. Okay. Another question: If a healthcare company is federally contracted with Medicare, do they have to pre-screen employees for marijuana? I don't think you have to pre-screen employees for marijuana, but if you come up, if you if you encounter it, then you don't have the leeway that Arizona law and other law gives you. You have to you have to treat it under the the uh, Drug Free Workplace Act of 1988. Okay, Just taking federal dollars. So you had also mentioned um, about if somebody doesn't want to come forward and they suspect somebody, and it's kind of an anonymous um, type of thing. Um, that that's not the, the credibility of that and to really be careful in that. 
How does that affect with um, like whistleblower policies? Wow, I mean that's that's a subject for a for a whole hour all by itself. <laughs> but it's a great question. Um, it, it, Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a great. I, I have many cases like that right now. It depends on what you're blowing the whistle on. Um, it, you know, it, if you're if you're if if by, by whistleblower you mean I'm I as an employee have observed that my fellow employee is stoned and I want to bring it to the attention of the boss because um, I want to blow the whistle on that. I don't. I don't think that's a that's per se a whistleblower situation because it's not bad conduct by the employer. It's bad conduct by an employee. Um, so I think you. I mean, I, I, there may be there may be um, in, small in, instances of Arizona law that I'm not thinking of at the moment. But um, that that would get treated as you know you're at your normal workplace investigation. I don't think you enjoy whistleblower protection under Arizona law simply by reporting a fellow employee anonymously for engaging in uh, marijuana use. Um, I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's the law. So. Okay. All right. Well, you have been a fountain of knowledge and I know I hit you with some pretty tough questions. Oh, I told a- you I was taking all kinds of notes while you were talking um, because um, so, and um, I really appreciate your time and being here. And I think this whole, um, as we continue to navigate through this, um, I think we're gonna see more and more, especially with the remote workers um, as an issue um, as yeah, we move forward. It's coming. And, and the, the thing that is fascinating to me is how do you establish metrics to keep people honest when you are having them work remotely? I guess it depends on the nature of your business. I mean, you know, I, I work in a law firm and we have a lot of folks who are working remotely. So, you know, if I'm meeting my deadlines and I'm handling the things I have to handle and returning my phone calls, there's really kind of no way to know uh, what what I'm involved in, as an example. Although I'm not not to worry, but you, you understand that's that's a that's still a problem that's fraught. Um, and then, it, but it also depends on the nature of the industry because, it, you know, if you're in a customer service situation where people have to see you and interact with you on a regular basis, it's much easier to, to ferret out those things, but it, it just, we're going to have to figure this out as we go. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of litigation and a lot of business for everyone like me to sort out those issues. So. Oh, well, thank you for that. Um, and Richard, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of you um, listening in today. Um, and if you have more questions for Richard, um, um, we will go ahead and um, send you out his contact information um, to feel free to reach out to them, to him directly. So thank you again for joining us. And I want to thank the City of Chandler Industrial Development Authority for their part, um, their contributions towards these programs. Um, next week, we we have how important video content is for marketing today. We have guest speakers, Mark Stewart and Jillian Grammer with Concept to Completion and also owner Jane Poston with J2 Media that's going to talk about that video component. And as businesses, this is an ever-changing world and we've got to be masters of a lot of different things. So I appreciate your time today. I'm Richard and can't wait to hear next week's program. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure to be here.